Good afternoon. My name is Jim Gilkerson. Um, I am Distinguished Corporate Fellow and Clinical Advisor for Boston Scientific Corporation. Boston Scientific is pleased to once again sponsor the new technology showcase. My company is dedicated to developing new ideas and innovations that help patients live longer, better, healthier lives. Boston Scientific is and has been an active member of Life Science Alley, and we're pleased to again support this highlight of the annual conference. The new technology showcase highlights 10 companies with novel products and therapies, each of which has the ability to impact patients and improve healthcare delivery. All of their technologies are on display in the new technology showcase section uh, in the Expo Hall, and seven companies will, will be presenting in the Spotlight Theater this afternoon. Congratulations to all of this year's finalists. Please be sure to stop by the special section in the Expo Hall and congratulate them and to view their innovative technologies. Three companies will now provide a six-minute overview of their new technologies and respective market opportunities. We'll move through the presentations quickly, so please seek out the company representatives at their displays if you have any questions for them. The first company that we will be hearing from is Inspire Medical Systems Incorporated from Maple Grove, Minnesota. Tim Herbert is their president and CEO and will be doing the presenting for that company. Next will be Mindful Scientific Incorporated from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Dr. Donald Weaver, their CEO, will be presenting for them. And last will be NovaScan LLC from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Dr. William Gregory, their co-founder, will be presenting. We all hear from all three in immediate succession. Tim, you're up. Thank you very much. It's, a, it's just a great privilege to be here today to be able to introduce Inspired Medical Systems and, and really promote uh, small startup companies here in Minneapolis. So as a quick introduction to Inspire, we spun out of Medtronic about in 2006, and we've come quite a year, quite a, quite a long way in that short period of time. We have a very strong intellectual property portfolio that we spun out of Medtronic. We are up to 23 employees globally now. And unique to having a company in Minneapolis, the experience of those 23 people, we, we added up all the medical device experience, and we exceed 350 years of medical device experience with those 23 people. We are commercially available in Europe. We have generated revenue. We have a very seasoned board of directors and investor group, including Dr. Glenn Nelson, who is our chairman. First, I need to introdu introduce obstructive sleep apnea, and many people in this room are very familiar with OSA. In fact, many people here probably have uh, tried the, the CPAP mask or even used it last night. So what, what sleep apnea is, it's a restriction of the airway during sleep, and it prevents oxygen from getting into the lungs and into the blood system to keep you healthy, and, and those continuous desaturations during the evening really have a significant effect on the body. The patients that we deal with have moderate to severe sleep apnea. In other words, they have at least 15 to sometimes greater than 30, 40 events per hour. So think about that, 30 events per hour, that's one every two minutes where you stop breathing during sleep and, and people recognize that as being maybe a little bit of snoring, but when the snoring becomes you stop breathing, that's when it becomes quite serious. All those repetitive oxygen desaturations during the night have a compounding effect on the body. So untreated sleep apnea has a very well-documented risk profile. You can kind of just see some of the key items right there with coronary artery disease, hypertension, congestive heart failures. It's even tied to type 2 diabetes. In fact, there's uh, publications now that relate it to early mortality. It, uh, one study in Australia talked about patients who are 45 with untreated severe sleep apnea is the equivalent of that patient being 55. They almost related that to a 10-year decrease. The good news on sleep apnea, there are options. Everybody has uh, been aware of continuous positive airway pressure. We use that mask during the night, and, and obviously it's not very invasive, but it certainly is very intrusive for those that have tried it. There are surgical options on the upper right-hand corner a lot of times what they can do is actually break your jaw and move your lower jaw forward about 10 centimeters, which creates volume at the base of the tongue. 
That obviously is a very invasive procedure, and sometimes what they have to do if you move it all too far, they have to break your upper jaw and move that out as well. So you can imagine the invasiveness of that. Less than 2,000 of those procedures are done on an annual basis. On the lower right corner is a pretty common procedure done about 40,000 times per year. It's called a U-triple-P or a uvula platophryngoplasty, where it's, just an, it's an excision of tissues of the upper airway, taking out your tonsils, your uvula, your adenoids, part of your soft palate. It's described as having a sore throat, the worst sore throat you ever had, and living with that for three weeks. Um, the sad part is it's only 50% effective. So there's a very good niche for uh, Inspire for the therapy. The 16 million people in the United States that have uh, sleep apnea of moderate to severe uh, nature, half of those can be treated with CPAP, so we're not going to worry about that, that half. About a third of that group is, is treatable by Inspire. That's about 2 million people in the United States, so it quickly calculates up to over a billion dollar market. To introduce Inspire, we have three components. And we have a neural stimulator that most people in this room are familiar with. We have a stimulation lead that's tunneled up the neck and implanted around the hypoglossal nerve that's just underneath your chin. We also have a sensing lead that's placed just below the pectoris muscle, and it's basically three easy skin incisions, so the recovery period is very quick. There's no permanent change to the anatomy, and uh, it's certainly reversible. It's about a two-hour procedure. What's important here is, is everybody who's worked in neural stimulation, it's key to be able to understand the mechanism of action. So here you can see on the left-hand side, you can see the airway collapsing. That's the tongue that you see falling into the airway. And on the right-hand side, we apply stimulation. You can see how the tongues pull forward. You can now see the epiglottis. You can see the air pipes and the vocal folds. So it's very easy for us to define what that mechanism is. As I mentioned, we spun out of Medtronic, so we have years of experience. We completed a proof of principle trial back in 2001. We did a 44-patient feasibility trial that we just completed in 2010, and we are currently in our phase three pivotal trial. It's a 120-patient trial. We expect to complete our implants here in the first quarter. And we're targeting our U.S. approval probably in about late 2013. One quick slide on data. Our objective measurement is the apnea hypopneic index. That's the number of events per hour. And you can see our, our patients go, at, go from a baseline of 34, again, over 30 is severe, to just about 11, just about 10. So that's a very successful therapy, and, and we can uh, clearly define how to select those patients. We also have show quality of life measures with statistical significance. Um, we've implanted over 100 patients to date and really showing significant quality of life. And finally, we just want to note that obstructive sleep apnea is a large unmet need. Uh, it's got a great first-line therapy in CPAP, but people are only 50% compliant to that therapy, so there's a need for alternative uh, therapies. It is a physiologic collapse of the airway. Therefore, there is no pharmaceutical solution to be able to, to treat that. And we can use objectively, objective data to evaluate the therapy because our patients have overnight sleep studies. And finally, it's a class three, it's a PMA. We have a very defined roadmap to obtain our regulatory approval. And uh, with, the, with the team that we have and, and the physicians that we're partnered with, um, we should be very successful in the near future. Thank you very much for the time and thank you for the honor. Hello. Uh, I'll join with the other uh, speakers in expressing my gratitude for the opportunity of being here. Uh, my name is uh, Don Weaver, and I'm a uh, clinical neurologist with Mindful Scientific, and we are out of uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Mindful Scientific is here to introduce our uh, new technology, which is the Halifax Consciousness Scanner, or HCS. And we're enthusiastic about the HCS because it represents a new method, a new approach for assessing human consciousness. More specifically, it represents a way that enables us to quantitatively and rigorously attach a number to the level of human consciousness in people who may be normal or may have had a significant brain injury or brain insult. So, there is definitely a need for improved assessment of consciousness. 
Um, if you look at it, this is a major problem throughout North America and the world. Traumatic brain injury is a problem affecting 3 million Americans a year. Uh, and traumatic brain injury extends from a minor issue, which is concussion, which may not be so minor, all the way to major problems which involve coma. Your brain is important. Your brain is what makes you you. Any brain injury could be serious and therefore every brain injury deserves to be treated seriously and evaluated seriously. Now, the reason that this is an unmet need and the reason that we need better assessments comes from the fact that the current way of evaluating brain injury and uh, lack of consciousness is through the Glasgow Coma Scale. This was developed in Scotland in 1974 and relies primarily on behavioral indicators. So you have to ask the person, you know, open your eyes, squeeze my hand, do something like this. The other issue is that it has a misdiagnosis rate of 43%, which is substantial. And indeed, a review in uh, 1992, which is coming up to 20 years ago, really said that it was uh, held an unwarranted position in clinical and investigative context. So clearly, we have an unmet need that needs a solution. So our solution then is the HCS, or Consciousness Scanner. This is an EEG-based point-of-care technology. And the way that this uh, really works is it measures a number of independent indicators of neuroprocessing uh, using event-related potentials based upon an EEG technology as mentioned. So we look at sensation, perception, attention, memory, language, the things that really make you you, that make your brain you, and that enable you to be conscious. And in fact, what we do is we assign a score of three to each one of these so that ultimately you end up with a score out of 15. So this is a very rapid test. It's non-invasive. It can be done in four to five minutes, which is much better over the normal standard of doing an EEG that would take uh, 45 minutes to do in a prolonged period of time to evaluate. So the HCS is, is like a headband. Uh, it extends from ear to ear and it has a handheld controller. You put it on, you press go, and four to five minutes later you get a score out of 15 that says if you are conscious, and hopefully you all are. The, um, uh, what's nice about it is, is that it doesn't require expert use. Anybody can use it. It can be used in any situation. So this is an extremely powerful technology. So our vision with this is that it's time to introduce not only the Halifax Consciousness Scanner, but a new vital sign. So everyone's used to the routine vital signs of heart rate, blood pressure, and temperature. It's time to add to this your consciousness score. So certainly, if you have a, uh, a child with an infection who has an elevated body temperature, perhaps it's time to see a physician. If you have a child who just came off the playing field, who's had a concussion, and whose consciousness score is less than 15, perhaps it's time to see a physician. So in this regard, it's a vital sign. The potential market for this is indeed significant, as uh, is clear. Uh, first of all, as already mentioned, there's the sports indications. So one can do a baseline preseason evaluation and can use it in return to play decisions. Uh, within a medical context, it has value in hospitals, not only in the acute setting, such as an emergency room, but also in long-term settings to monitor patients who are in coma or have a chronic uh, dementing disorder. And of course, there's military applications because of the role of head trauma uh, in military. And uh, finally, of there is the uh, use of this in public places. Certainly in buildings such as this, we have AEDs, automated uh, defibrillators, and it stands to reason that your brain is important and that these devices have a role to play side by side with automatic defibrillators. So why is this so uh, effective? Uh, the secret uh, sauce here is uh, our algorithm. And so if I were to say to you right now, this pizza is much too hot to sing. All of your brains just popped and evoked potential on the word sing, saying, what's he talking about? That reflects your level of consciousness. And we have crammed that uh, and a number of other equal tricks into four to five minutes, and we monitor your brain response to it. The end result of that is that we are able to look at you and to get an assessment of what your level of consciousness is. Uh, certainly, we are continuing to develop this technology. Uh, 
It is uh, undergoing clinical studies in Canada right now, uh, both in uh, concussion, which is mild head trauma, but also in uh, more significant uh, events such as coma. Uh, and it's also currently being evaluated by one NHL hockey team. Uh, uh, we also like to think that the Toronto Maple Leaf fan should use it because they're used to hitting their heads against the wall. Um, in terms of its continued development, uh, this uh, we are targeting for a 510K uh, and uh, a Health Canada submission in the second quarter of 2012. So your brain is important, and we'd like you to always be mindful when you think of head trauma. Thank you. Well, I'd uh, like to add my thank you to Life Sciences Alley for this uh, honor of coming here today. Um, NovaScan has developed an electrical method for detecting uh, whether uh, cells are cancer or normal based on the uh, rate at which they accept electrical charge. Uh, we believe this is a platform technology, but we are initially working with breast cancer and I'll talk about two types of devices that we're working on today. One is um, a surgical cancer probe, and the second is an electrical mammogram. The statistics for these devices um, uh, I have just shown here, and I'll repeat it again later. Um, <clears throat> the residual cancer detector is solving the following problem. In uh, breast conservation therapy, in other words, using uh, uh, lumpectomies or, or partial mastectomies, the risk is the cancer will be left after the patient has <clears throat> gone off the table and gone home because the slides don't come back to the path lab uh, before that happens. In fact, of the order of 20 to 40 percent of the surgeries have to be repeated, <clears throat> in, in some cases even the third time. So I'd like to show you something that one of our surgeons tells you about this probe. A local inventor is on the verge of groundbreaking breast cancer technology. In Health First, a story you'll see only on 12 News. Hillary Mint shows us two devices that could revolutionize breast cancer treatment and prevention. Dr. Judy Tijo is a breast cancer surgeon with Aurora Sinai Medical Center operating almost every day. So this is the cancer that we biopsy. But lately she's been performing more and more double mastectomies, removing both breasts is a trend she says is driven by patients' fear of cancer coming back. But Tijo says sometimes it's unnecessary. We like to remove only what we need to remove and keep what, let the patient keep what she can. Um, so to know that information ahead of time would help us plan a better surgery. And breast cancer surgeons like Tijo may soon have that technology right in the palm of their hands. This is very groundbreaking. It's an electrical probe about the size of an electric toothbrush. It's still being tested, but Dr. Tijo helped design it for surgery. So to have this that we could actually pass inside the breast cavity to say, yes, we've removed all evidence to disease would be groundbreaking. Milwaukee physicist Bill Gregory and his partner biologist Biologist James Marks brought this prototype to life. Through nearly 15 years of research with their company NovaScan and help from Aurora, they figured out cancer cells give off electrical signals, and this probe can detect those signals. So give the surgeon a chance, real time, while she's doing the operation, to uh, get rid of that. Uh, what we call residual cancer. They're also testing electrical signals in mammograms. The idea is that eventually the electrical mammogram would be on here, the standard mammogram machine. It'd do three things. It'd be more comfortable, no radiation, but the biggest thing is that it'd be easily able to detect non-cancerous versus cancerous lumps. An electrical mammogram would be able to detect that the cells here are malignant without the biopsy. Dr. Tijo says fewer procedures and tests will give patients more peace of mind. In Milwaukee, Hillary Mintz, WISN 12 News. At best, after larger clinical trials and FDA approval, the electrical wand would be ready by 2015. The electrical mammogram is expected to take a little longer to get approved due to funding. Okay. Um, they didn't show much of the electrical mammogram thing, so let me tell you real quick about that. Um, we simply replace parts of the standard mammo machine shown here with our uh, electrodes. The bottom electrode 
has a, an array of 256 16 by 16 electrodes. And the kind of scan you get <clears throat> looks like this. Um, it's a pattern of the current uh, distributed across the breast. Uh, this particular patient had no uh, anomalies. They would be black. We put some tape on to convince ourselves we would have found them. The second on the right shows uh, two masses. Uh, the first mass it is, is only three millimeters in size. It's less than one quarter the area of one of those little squares representing one, uh, uh, one uh, sensor. The reason it's big is because it's very close to the uh, electrodes and uh, the size is then related to the electrodes. By the way, you cannot see that. I can show you the x-ray if you come to our booth. You can't see that on the x-ray. Mass number two was bigger and both of them were uh, uh, IDC, invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, our current situation, we have a phase two uh, NSF grant. Uh, we are uh, working on a, we have raised the, the match for a phase two B, um, and we hope to have uh, a second round a little later to get to Canada, Europe, and perhaps to India. And uh, we're in booth 825, and uh, here are some of the stats from the two studies we've done. You're welcome to come visit us. Thank you.